Uh, and we are ready for our next speaker, Danica Chen. All right. Um, it's uh, really a delight to be here, and uh, it's uh, thrilling to see how much this meeting has grown over the years. And my question to Morton is, at the rate the meeting is growing, are you sure you can find a room big enough to accommodate this crowd? <laughs> it might work. We need some creativity there. <laughs> Okay, uh, so today I'm going to talk about stem cells. Now, stem cells has, uh, have received uh, much attention in aging research for a good reason, and we already heard this morning from Tom Randall. Now, there's a large body of literature supporting the idea that stem cell function declines with age, and this contributes to the degeneration and dysfunction of aging tissues. Now, using the hematopoietic stem cells as an example, the regenerative capacity of hematopoietic stem cells decreases during aging, and aged hematopoietic stem cells are biased towards differentiation into the myeloid lineage and away from the lymphoid lineage. And this is consistent with the physiological changes of the blood system, such as increased inflammation and compromised immunity. And this is also consistent with the pathological changes of the aging immune system. And I'll just give you one example. Childhood leukemia tend to be of a lymphoid origin, and uh, old individuals tend to develop leukemia of myeloid lineage. So there's much interest in understanding how stem cells deteriorate during aging and leading to tissue degeneration and dysfunction. Now, stem cells have a lot of decisions to make. As Tom Randall mentioned earlier, most of the time, they are quiescent. And this is important because they don't want to exhaust themselves. They have to stay with us throughout the entire lifespan. But when the time is to repair and regenerate, they need to proliferate. And they need to make the decision whether they differentiate or they remain self-renewal and remain at the stem cells. So how do stem cells make these decisions? Recently, there have been numerous studies looking at mitochondria in stem cells. So here I'm really just summarizing a large body of literature uh, in recent years. Um, so it's a really looking at the stem cells from different tissues, and there are actually some common themes. Now, mitochondria biogenesis is regulated by the M2 pathway and the PGC1 alpha transcription factor and the TFAM transcription factor. It has been shown that my M2 activation promotes mitochondria biogenesis in stem cells and promotes stem cell proliferation and differentiation. But it also leads to loss of stem cell quiescence and self-renewal. Now, you may argue that, well, mTOR activation can lead to uh, many different pathways, so it's not just mitochondrial biogenesis. Fair enough. However, PGC1 alpha and TFAM also impact stem cells in a similar fashion as mTOR activation. Now, mitochondria produce ROS, and this is handled by oxidative stress response pathways. Now, FOXO transcription factors uh, regulate the expression of antioxidant. And my lab and others have shown that at the post-translational level, this is regulated by SIR-T3, a mitochondria protein deacetylase. Now, too much ROS is not good, and too little is also good, and it's considered reductive stress. And this is a, controlled by the reductive stress response mediated by FNIP. And FNIP is uh, degraded, and this leads to mitochondrial activation, increased ROS production. And it has been shown that FOXO and SIR-T3 suppress oxidative stress and prevent loss of stem cell quiescence and self-renewal. Conversely, FNIP suppresses a reductive stress response in stem cells and promote stem cell proliferation and differentiation. Another type of uh, mitochondrial stress is a protein folding stress. 
And this is handled by the mitochondria unfolded the protein response, which induces the expression of mitochondria chaperones and proteases such as HSP60 and the long one. And my lab discovered another branch of the mitochondria unfolded protein response mediated by a histone deacetylase 37. And 37 suppresses the expression of mitochondrial ribosomal proteins and uh, reduces mitochondrial translation. As you can imagine, this can help cells to recover the stress when they are experiencing uh, the, the protein folding problem inside the mitochondria. And has been shown that a 37, HSP60, and a long one suppress mitochondrial protein folding stress in stem cells and improve stem cell self-renewal. Mitochondria convert between this tubulated form and a fragmented form through mitochondrial fusion and mitochondrial fission. Now, mitochondrial fusion is mediated by mitochondrial fusings and OPA1, and mitochondrial fission is mediated by DOP1. And it has been shown that a mitochondrial fission is associated with a stem cell proliferation and a differentiation, but mitochondrial fusion <laughs> is associated with a stem cell self-renewal. And finally, mitophagy. Uh, it's a form of autophagy that uh, taking care of a damaged mitochondria and it's mediated by pink one parking. And it has been shown that mitophagy is required to promote stem cell self-renewal. However, too much mitophagy is also not good and this can suppress stem cell proliferation and differentiation. Now from this study, it seems like mitochondria can actually dictate the stem cell fate. Now, quiescent stem cells have increased mitochondrial fusion and increased anti antioxidative activity. However, proliferating stem cells have increased mitochondrial biogenesis, and this is important to increase the ATP production and to increase the production of ROS, and both of which are required to support a stem cell proliferation. Proliferating stem cells also have increased mitochondrial fission, which has been shown to be uh, required uh, for effective mitophagy and removing damaged mitochondria. Now, if a, my, my, mitochondria can dictate stem cell fate, how do they do that? There seems to be many models that have been proposed. Now, the first one is um, uh, metabolic regulation. Quiescent stem cells primarily use glycolysis. Now, compared to OX4, glycolysis produces less ATP. However, it's uh, sufficient to meet the low energy demand of a quiescent stem cells. Now, this is important because by bypassing the use of mitochondria, less ROS is produced, and this is uh, important for the long-term maintenance of a quiescent stem cells. Now, when stem cells transition from a quiescence to differentiation, there's an increase in mitochondrial biogenesis, and this is associated with the metabolic reprogramming from glycolysis to ox force to increase the production of ATP, as well as the generation of ROS. Quiescent stem cells has also been shown to use fatty acid oxidation. Now, why is this relevant? Compared to glycolysis, glycolysis and ox force produces NADH. However, beta oxidation produces both NADH and FADH. Now, NADH enters the electron transport train through complex one, but FADH enters the electron transport train through complex two, bypassing complex one. Now, by bypassing complex one, which is a major site for ROS production, um, it can actually reduce the generation of ROS. Another model is uh, epigenetic regulation of stem cell fate. Now, many mitochondria TC cycle intermediates are in fact cofactors of epigenetic regulators. 
And there have been several studies suggesting that uh, mitochondria can actually con can, uh, regulate stem cell fate through epigenetic regulation. Now, for example, ATP citrate lias can uh, convert citrate to acetyl-CoA and therefore affects histone acetylation. And it has been shown that ATP citrate lias can promote a stem cell proliferation and differentiation. And this is associated with histone acetylation uh, as the promoters of genes that regulate the stem cell fate. Hydroxyglutarate has been shown uh, to regulate a stem cell fate as well, and it is an inhibitor of alpha-ketoglutarate-mediated demethylation. So these are just a couple of examples. Another mechanism could be redox signaling. Uh, ROS have been shown to induce a retrograde signaling pathway mediated by NIF2. Now, NIF2 transcription factor can not only regulate the expression of antioxidant genes, but also uh, many genes that are related to a selfie decision. Now, my lab also showed that in hematopoietic stem cells, uh, ROS can actually induce an immune response and most specifically, the NRP3 inflammasome activation. Now, NRP3 inflammasome is uh, primarily uh, studied in the, uh, in the immune system, but we found that it's also expressed in the hematopoietic stem cells. Now, when it's activated during aging, it leads to the activation of caspase-1 mediated cell death and resulting in the loss of uh, stem cell self-renewal. And this process can be suppressed by SOT2 uh, deacetylase. This is an interesting one, uh, asymmetric inheritance. Now when stem cells divide, all the organelles are evenly distributed between two daughter cells, except for the mitochondria. Now it turns out the young mitochondria with increased antioxidative capacity uh, will go into the stem cells that remain stem cell. However, old mitochondria with increased ox force activity will go to the daughter cell that differentiate. So this is a, a very interesting uh, observation. Now, why is this relevant to us? Uh, is, this, is this changing during aging? Well, first of all, my lab and others have shown that mitochondrial stress, including mitochondrial oxidative stress and mitochondrial protein folding stress increases in stem cells during aging. And there are numerous studies suggesting that mitochondrial dysfunction and aging produce similar defects in stem cells. And finally, uh, what is interesting is that stem cells actually do not age at the same rate, and about one-third of a chronologically aged hematopoietic stem cells have a regenerative capacity of young hematopoietic stem cells. And they can be physically separated based on the health of the mitochondria. So that's another evidence suggesting that mitochondria can actually dictate uh, stem cell aging. Now, if mitochondrial stress increases during aging, how, how, did, how did they increase? So we have found that uh, several sirtuins, uh, 32, 33, and 37, uh, protect mitochondria in stem cells. And during aging, these sirtuins, uh, their expression decreases. Uh, it has also been shown that NAD level decreases during aging in stem cells, and together this may also contribute to reduced activity of sirtuins and increased mitochondrial stress. Now, if that's the case, uh, we should be able to target this pathway to reverse stem cell aging. And I'm only showing you a couple of data slides here. Uh, this is one experiment we did. So we overexpressed 32, 33, and or 37 in aged hematopoietic stem cells, and we were able to improve the regenerative capacity. And this is another experiment. We overexpressed 37 in the hippocampus of old mice, and we were able to improve 
neurogenesis and a cognitive function of old mice. Now, does this have a therapeutic potential? Uh, as you know, um, NAD boosting is now being explored as a way to activate the situants, and there are many studies showing that NAD boosting can improve mitochondrial health and stem cell health. So finally, I'd just like to thank the students who did all the work. And of course, I presented uh, many, many studies from other labs and also the funding sources. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Danica. Do we have, uh, do we have um, questions? Otherwise, uh, I, I will uh, ask a question. So mitochondria are very central in your, in your world, uh, but there's also, I've worked uh, in the past a little bit about uh, how, for example, nucleus or other processes can influence the, the mitochondria. What, what do you think is the contribution? Yeah, that is a, a very interesting question, right? So I think there's definitely some evidence that the mitochondria can uh, talk to the nucleus. And uh, I think, uh, uh, and also I wanted to refer to uh, Tom Randall's talk, and uh, he actually started uh, from the nucleus uh, looking at epigenetics, and now is also tracing back to, uh, to the metabolism. So I think that definitely in coming years, we'll see lots of studies in that direction. All right. Oh. Thank you. Great presentation. Are there any side effects of serotonin uh, or NAD replacement in, in the mice? Um, so, so in, um, in the published literature, um, NAD boosting has been shown to uh, extend lifespan in mice. And I'm, I think in this morning, we actually heard some talks about NMN boosting in humans. Um, so I think we will see uh, more and more data coming out uh, on NAD boosting in humans. And I, there was a published study uh, last year looking at uh, the effect of NMN in pre-diabetic women. So there was a mild effect in uh, improving their insulin uh, sensitivity. Mm. Oh. We have not done the NAD boosting uh, ourselves. So these are all based on the published data. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Danica. Really great talk.